Hey, how's it going? Uh, welcome back to my channel. So today I need to get cracking on the next steps um, for finishing the veneer on the um, outside of these bellows frames. And also, hopefully I can install the little uh, threaded inserts for the uh, thumb screws. So we uh, got a few things to do today. Cool, let's get to it. Cheers. And we're going to get started. So I these are already pretty flat. So I'm going to start at 150. Or maybe I should just start. Yeah, maybe I'll start a little bit lower than that. So I... I organize my sandpaper according to grit, which is really helpful. Get a, you know, get one of these um, accordion folders and then, you know, separate them according to grit. So you can always find the right grit sandpaper you're looking for. So I'm just gonna sand the ends flat here, and I'm like that's pretty good. I mean, they're already flat, of course. I just want to try to get that surface as smooth as possible. Alright, <clears throat> just go ahead and move on to the next grit. I've got 150 here, and I'll uh, just sand. Just keep sanding up. Try to alternate the scratch directions um, as I go, so they don't have to be perfectly you know, perpendicular to the previous scratch marks, as long as they're not in the same direction. Okay, so I'm going to just move up to 220 here, and uh, just keep going. Again, alternating the grain direction from the previous grit. Okay, so I've got the uh, my frames here sanded up to 220 grit, and uh, the grain still needs to be filled a bit, but we'll worry about that later. For now, what I want to focus on is the cutting of the grooves in the in the face of the um, the decorative grooves in the face of the uh, the frame ends here, and the way I do this is with this Stanley number no. 66 uh, beater, I guess they call it, um, and I got this uh, off of eBay for very inexpensive because it was missing the fence, so I had to make my own fence, and it was missing, it didn't have any cutters with it, and uh, so I had to make all my own cutters, um, and I made this just on my manual milling machine out of a sheet of uh, tool steel. Um, and temp hardened and tempered it. I made it a couple years ago, so I don't have any, you know, I can't show me making it, but um, I've been using it for a while and it works pretty well. Uh, and so all you gotta do is just set the fence and then scrape the, uh, the cutter along the, uh, the surface of the veneer. And it makes this nice decorative, this nice decorative set of grooves in the face. I'm afraid to admit that um, I'm not quite sure the purpose of these grooves. I think they look nice, so obviously they serve a decorative function. I don't know if they serve some other function aside from that. I doubt it. I think that they're just like a de decorative touch. Um, and I think they look nice, and it's a traditional aspect of the of the um, making of a concertina. It's kind of like a like a fiddle F-hole. It's like, well, you could cut that hole any shape, and it would the instrument would sound the same, but cutting it in that F shape um, is... Uh, is a tradition of fiddle making and um you know so people try to honor that tradition and so this is me honoring the tradition of concertina making by cutting these grooves in the face of the uh the wood here so you just start in slow and it takes many multiple passes so you just scrape scrape and you just go over and over until you start to see that shape come in There, I think that looks pretty good. And just go all the way around. So I'm just going to go all the way around just like that on uh, both sides, and then we'll go on to the next step. All right. I've finished the grooving operation on uh, these ends here, and you can see the groove goes all the way around. And I've experimented with grooving the whole board all at once and then gluing it up, but I find that you, because it's easier to do a groove like that on one long continuous block, obviously, um, but then it doesn't, you know, it, I find it matches up better um, if you do it after it's all glued up in a hexagram form, so that's why I do it at this point. Okay, so I made a little test panel here of all the different ways that I have accumulated over the years of making stuff black, and I didn't realize I had so many different ways of making stuff black, but I guess I do. So we've got uh, India ink, this trans tint stuff that I got at some woodworking store. This is a uh, quebracho powder um, mixed with uh, ferrous oxide. So what you do is you paint on this 
uh, Cabracho powder, which is um, a tannin powder that's derived from the uh, from the bark of the Cabracho tree. And uh, you're supposed to put it on there and let it dry and then paint on ferrous oxide. And then that's supposed to blacken it. And I've, the first couple of times I tried that years ago, it worked really well. And, but um, the past few times it has not worked really at all. And I think maybe it's because um, this rust solution is just not, there's something wrong. I need to make up a new fresh batch of rust solution. Uh, I don't know, because it used to work really well, but now it doesn't work at all. So this is the Minwax Ebony Stain, which was uh, not great. Um, this is this uh, General Finishes Ebony Stain, which is better, um, but it's, not, it's still not great. Uh, and then I thought, just for fun, I might try... Um, this is nail polish and that just globs on the surface. Like it'll make it black, but it won't, I mean, you'll lose any semblance of, uh, of the woodness of the wood. If you try to actually make it black with the nail polish, that's not going to work. And then this is a uh, acrylic black paint, which actually turned out to be like gray. And it's kind of the same situation where like, well, yeah, you can paint it black, but then it's, you know, it doesn't even look like wood or anything so and then this was the cabracho dissolved in alcohol instead of water and it basically gave the same result um actually it did worse because the cabracho powder didn't even dissolve in the alcohol it just kind of um the cabracho actually did dissolve in water um and it's kind of funny this stuff smells like tea like i drink a lot of tea and this stuff smells like tea um so you can you can definitely tell like tea has a lot of uh tannins in it as well you know because it's that that smell of the tannin that makes tea smell like that. Um, so other people have done, you know, ebonizing of wood with tea. If you just steep the wood in, you know, in tea and it soaks up that tannin. Um, but for this experiment, I would say far and away the best way to ebonize uh, at least walnut um, under these conditions uh, was the India ink. I mean, that looks really nice, flat, black, beautiful. And that's two, that's two coats of black India ink, but that the India ink just blew away the competition. So that's what I'm going to go with here. So uh, all right, all right. I'm just going to go ahead and fill this little cup with uh, a little bit of India ink and just start painting the wood. Painting, I don't know, applying the India ink uh, onto the, into the grain of the wood. Um, just rub it in and then let it dry. And use the tip to kind of get into that groove to make sure that that's gets blackened as the whole point of cutting those grooves before the staining was so that you know that they would get blackened too it would look silly if, if it was like that and there was like if the groove didn't get ebonized you know that would look really cheesy um, so yeah I'm just gonna get to it apply this over the whole surface of the uh, of both of these frames and then um, I'm gonna let it dry and then I'll do a second coat because it didn't really get black until there was like a second coat. Uh, so that's what I'm gonna do now and then we'll uh, catch up uh, after I'm done. Cheers. All right, so I got these ends here and uh, I put India ink um, on all those faces and then um, I uh, started to French polish. I put some shellac on and some pumice powder and tried to rub it in and fill the grain with the pumice powder and it just made a big mess. So, um, I'm not too happy with how that's turning out. So what I'm going to try to do is I sanded this one down back down already. Um, sanded it back down flat. And I'm just going to try to fill the grain here um, with, a, with a black epoxy and, um, and then sand it flush and it'll just leave a perfectly smooth face. And then I'll try to put the India ink on over that. And I'll do my best to not get epoxy into, the, um, into these little uh, grooves here that I carved. But if I do, I can always clean it back out with that same, just going back over it with the uh, the beater um, and cut those back out. But um, so yeah, so that's what I'm gonna do next. Um, I'm probably uh, not gonna bother getting that on camera, but I'm gonna mix up some epoxy, put some black in there, and then fill the pores and sand it flat, and then we'll see, and then we'll go from there. Yep. Well, maybe I will show it. So why not? People might want to see that. I don't know. It's freezing. It's negative nine degrees Fahrenheit today in uh, Denver, Colorado. So it's it's a little it's a little chilly out here in the workshop. Um, all right. All 
Alright, so we'll fill this up. And I might just be totally ruining the end. I mean, everything, there's always critical points where you're at some place where, oh, I might just be totally ruining all the work that I just did. You know, you have to be brave and just kind of do stuff and not worry about whether or not it's going to end up, uh, it's going to result in you, you know, um, you know, having to redo a bunch of work, which I have had to do. I mean, the amount of things that I've had to redo, you know, is just kind of staggering when you think about how many hours I've spent doing something that was a waste. Now, was it ultimately a waste? You know, who knows? Nothing's ever a waste. It's just a learning experience. And that's really true. Uh, you really kind of have to cultivate that that understanding that, uh, you know, you drive yourself crazy if you think of all of your mistakes as is a waste of time. I really wish I hadn't cut those grooves already. That would have made this a, a lot easier. Well, maybe I'll just not worry about the grooves. Maybe I'll just go for it and then recut the grooves after the epoxy sets because trying to go around the grooves and make sure that I don't get any in the grooves like that's not really realistic I think so let's just not worry about it so I'm gonna I know that this looks bad um, I'm gonna sand it back flat after the epoxy dries and um, and then all the epoxy will be gone except for tiny little flecks that remain in the in the grain of the epoxy uh, so you know, you gotta be brave. But hopefully this will create a nice smooth surface that um, will be perfect for French polishing now. And, you know, I mean, hopefully this looks good because, I don't know, this is all kind of new. We've never done it exactly this way before and whenever you do something, you know, new, it's not exactly the way you've done it before, then you can't be sure that uh, it's going to turn out exactly the same way it did before. And sometimes, even if you do do it exactly the way you did before, it still doesn't turn out that way. So it's all just kind of a learning experience. The scariest thing about making concertinas is that um, people expect you to know everything about everything about concertina making. And... I know a lot about concertina making. I've been doing it for years and years. You know, I have at least 10,000 hours of concertina making experience, which according to Malcolm Gladwell would make me an expert at making concertinas. Um, but, you know, that doesn't mean that I know everything about everything about making concertinas. And I wouldn't consider myself an expert. I think that's ridiculous though I do have at least 10,000 hours of concertina making experience. I don't know what that means, though. Um, I think I'm a, just a student of concertina making. And uh, I do my best to learn as much about the craft as I can, all aspects of the craft. Okay. Um, and I just kind of plod along. But thankfully, there's not that much, you know, competition. <laughs> so I'm going to try to scrape off as much of the excess as I can. There we go, scrape off the excess. Then you're left with a nice flat surface where all the little holes are going to be filled with epoxy. Alright, so here they are after I've um, applied the epoxy. Uh, it's still wet. Um, but I'm gonna just let that dry and then I'll sand it flat and then that'll be that should be a nice clean surface for okay so I've got um, the uh, black epoxy on here the ebonized epoxy and it's filled the grain uh, but it looks pretty ugly so I'm gonna try to flatten the surface but um, I'm not gonna use a very rough grit of sandpaper because I don't want to I don't want to 
uh, grind down through the surface that I filled with the epoxy, um, I just want to flatten the surface. So I'm going to start at maybe uh, 220 grit sandpaper here. And, um, and I'll be using my flat stone here. Uh, and you could use just a sheet of plate glass uh, for this, or if you had like an old slab of of quartz like this, that'd be fine too, or a surface plate or whatever, you know. Um, but the plate glass that you can get cut at the hardware store is pretty flat. It's not surface plate flat, but it's definitely flat enough for this kind of thing. So, so I'm just going to try to flatten this down. And then I want that surface really flat. And you can see that it filled in all of the little imperfections in the grain. Um, in preparation for French polishing. It doesn't take much to clean it up, to flatten it up, but you can see that the grain is now filled. So when I go into French polish, there'll be a nice clean surface to lay that shellac down on. Now all I've got to do is reopen these, um, the grooves that got filled with, you know, epoxy. Whoops. Just here. I should be able to just scrape that epoxy right back out of the grooves. Uh, it looks pretty good. The grain is filled um, and that's ready for French polish. So I'm just going to go ahead and do the same thing on the other 11 sides, the other, the other 11 sides of this instrument. Just flatten the grain, re-blacken it with the ink, and then start building up the body of the French polish on that surface. So, all right. Okay, so here are the ends, and I haven't sprayed the lacquer yet, but I decided that I want to um, install the little threaded inserts first, um, just because I think it'll be cleaner spraying the lacquer over the insert and then cleaning up the threads, um, rather than trying to cut, mill the slot after the lacquer's already installed. It would, that would be ugly. So I'm going to go ahead and install these first before I spray the lacquer. So what I'm basically trying to do is, um, you can see, uh, I want, uh, well, let's take a look here. So... I can create a new sketch here, and I want, you can see where the handrail goes, right here, and um, I want the, uh, the thumb screw insert to be right in line with um, uh, where the handrail mounts. So I want the thumb screw to be right in line here, which means I need to put the center of the thumb screw on the surface of this wood that's going to be right in line so that that leather goes, um, gets, yeah, basically. I, I hope that makes sense. Anyway, so I need to know this dimension from this point to, um, oh, I need to project that into the drawing. And then there, and then I need to know the dimension from that point to that intersection there is 247,000. So I need to touch off on this edge and then move in 247,000 and put the insert there in line with that uh, dimension. So that's what I'm going to do now before I spray the lacquer. Ha! Ah, cool. Cheers. Ah. Okay, so this is the right end going this direction, which means that the um, strap screw insert needs to get inserted right there. Now I don't want to make any mistakes <laughs> uh, because I don't want to mill the hole in the wrong place. So that's where it goes. I'm going to stick this, let's see, stick that there and then put one parallel down. i got to crank this down a bit. Very good. And we'll put another parallel. Very good. Oh, dang it. This is always so finicky. There we go. There we go. Oh, dang it. And we'll just snug that up. I want to, let's see, make one more time. Yep, so that's definitely where we need to put it. Clamp this up just lightly along the bottom. We can go a little bit tighter. 
on these top clamps. Um, and if you don't do this, then there's not enough, the setup's not rigid enough to actually get a clean cut on the surface of the, of the thing there. So the way I find the edge is I get this little tool, which is um, called a wiggler. And I got this, this is an antique one that I got off of eBay from, it's a genuine stare at wiggler. Uh, and I got it just for pretty much this purpose. There we go, you stick it in the collet. All right. And these are kind of cool, this is like kind of old school machining here, you know. Let's see if I can get enough Z travel to even get this in shape. Alright. So there we go, get that ready, bring it up. Alright, and then what we're going to do is get our little stylus. And um, I'm going to turn on the spindle. And then you can center the wiggler with a stylus until it's running perfectly true just at the tip there. And then you know that that tip is directly in line with the spindle center line. And you run that in, run it down. I just try to run that over until it looks like it's exactly right on that the the vertex of that joint there, and um, and then I try to find the edge. So I could put an edge finder in here, but I mean, you know, it's not that critical. We can just get this done by eye. Bring it in. And I'll say that that is Y0 and X0. Now, we wanted the center line of that to be 247 in. So we'll run that in 247 in X. Great. So we can lock that up. And then, uh, let's see. That width of that should be 937. And I want the center of the machined hole, the machine screw hole that the thumb screw is actually going to go into to be right in the middle. And I know that that uh, screw is, the center of the machine screw hole is concentric with the outer radius of the, um, actually both of these holes, the center of the hole is concentric with the outside radius because that's the way I designed it. So I know that if I just plunge the end mill right there, then that will put the center of that screw right there. It'll automatically center itself. So um, we're just going to, yeah, just bang this out. So, so we're going to go in 469, and we're going to call that, oh wait, great, we're going to call that Y0, and then, uh, and then we're just going to make that cut. So all I'm going to do, here is a end mill, and it's that 230 end mill again, um, 200, 230 thousandths diameter, and I'm just going to plunge in and run that back until the slot is cut. I just need to figure out how deep. So the overall width of these is 370 and the cutter is 230 so it needs to go an extra 140 thousandths in to make room for the insert so Okay. Okay, so here we go. Let's get a feeler gauge. That feeler gauge is, I don't know, how thick is this feeler gauge? 10,000. Great. So let's come over, bring this up, touch that off. Right about there, we'll set that to 90. Now the thickness of this stock was 95 thousandths, so it's got to go in 95 thousandths. So we're just going to go ahead and turn the spindle on.
All right, so I ran that in 140,000. All right, we got this lovely slot here now. All I have to do is drill the holes for the um, for the screws. One's for a wood screw, and the other's for the threads for the machine screw to go through. And we're going to run that back up to zero, and we are going to cut. Drill the hole for um, for the machine screw. And I think it's a 440 thread, and the major diameter of a 440 thread is 113, something like that. 440, major diameter 112. So if I drill it with this 113 drill, should be able to run a 440 thread through there. And uh, without hurting anything, be okay. There we go. And then obviously the machine threads will get filled with lacquer when I spray, but I can just run a tap through and clean them back up. So no big deal. All right, very good. All right, let's bring this in. See how she fits. Oh, beautiful. Look at that. Beautiful. Now all we got to do is um, run the screw in. So. Did you look at that? Beautiful. There you go. And then the thumb screw. You'll... This isn't the thumb screw that's going on this instrument. It's just a one that I happen to have lying around. But it goes all the way in, just like that. Really nice. All right. All right. Now I can just clean that up with a little bit of sandpaper. And uh, and there you go. Did a really good job there. Um. So, I am basically just have to do that on the other end. Oh, and then this needs to be cleaned up, so I'll clean that up with a... Um, I hope I got that in the right place. Uh, let's take a look. Let's see. Let's see. Here's an end. That'll be for that size concertina. And it surely does look like that is right in line with that end. So that's nice. That's what you want it to look like. And then... When the letter's flattened over there, the thumb screw will be like right in the center there, so it'll look good. Um, won't be in some awkward place. So all I have to do is cut that down and uh, clean that up so it doesn't interfere with anything on the inside of the on the the action space. Um, and then I'm gonna spray this down with uh, some some lacquer finish. So that's what I'm gonna do next. I'm gonna do basically the same thing on the other side to put the insert in on the left side of the instrument and then we'll spray down some lacquer. Cool. Cheers. Okay, so I've got both of the inserts installed and screwed in, glued in, and um, I'm going to go ahead and spray one coat of this uh, nitrocellulose lacquer. Um, now my main concern is that the, uh, the grooves will get too filled with lacquer and they will get washed out and you won't see them, in which case I'll probably have to clean them back out after I've applied the lacquer um, and after it's cured. Um, and I don't know, there's a lot of concerns here, but uh, I think that you just have to be brave and try stuff out and see what works. So here we go. Okay. 
All right. Hang that up to dry. All right, that's pretty good. It's nice and black. That's kind of kind of what I was going for. <laughs> um, even if it's not. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's pretty good. Hang that up. Let it dry. All right. I'll come back to that and apply another coat in about an hour.